Okay, good afternoon and welcome. Um, we'll be starting the webinar in approximately five minutes, so um, still definitely got time for a coffee. Um, make yourself comfortable. Afternoon everyone that's just joined us. Uh, we will be starting sharply at two o'clock. Um, so you've still got enough time. Grab a coffee, uh, get your questions at the ready. Speak to you shortly. Okay, for those that just joined us, we will be starting the webinar shortly in three minutes time. Okay, if you've got your coffees, make sure uh, you've got some questions at the ready. Uh, we do have a colleague uh, handling the Q&A section of the webinar. So if you've got any questions throughout, paste them in the Q&A section. We'll be taking these as we can. Okay, afternoon everyone. Uh, we will be starting shortly. Two minutes left. Um, we'll be kicking off the webinar.
Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, on this sunny Thursday afternoon. Um, I'm sure everyone's in a great mood after last night's game, uh, but we're not here to talk about football, unfortunately. Um, my name is Mike Tansy from Silver Sands. I'm the account and marketing director. And with me today, I have the brilliant Rob White, our Microsoft 365 lead. Uh, between Rob and I, we've helped hundreds of customers uh, move file data into 365. And today we're excited to share our experience, the tips, the tricks on how to make a successful file migration into 365 in 2024. Um, for those that haven't been to a Silver Sands webinar before, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. The session today is being recorded, a copy of which will be made available to everyone tomorrow. Um, for any questions, we are saving 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for questions um, but we, uh, with Rob, but we also have James Malu, our principal consultant, on the webinar. James will be monitoring the um, Q&A section, so if you've got any questions, paste them in there on the, on the top, and James will answer those as we go. Keeps them in a nice thread. And finally, we will be offering a free one-to-one -one follow-up workshop for each of the companies here today. This is a consultant-led workshop. It's to discuss your farm migration challenges with one of our specialists. Um, and to take us up on this request, simply tick the request follow-up box in the survey and one of our team will be in touch. OK, so before I hand over to Rob, I'll do a very quick overview to Silver Sands. Um, I, can, I know we've got a lot of customers on here today, but some new faces also. And that's it. Perfect. So for those that are less familiar, Silver Sands, we are a Microsoft consultancy specialising in Microsoft 365 cloud and hybrid infrastructure. Um, so we work across four key areas. Firstly, it's Microsoft 365, which includes over 50 applications such as Teams, SharePoint and OneDrive, to name a few. Microsoft 365 also includes your Windows operating system and enterprise mobility and security for protecting those endpoints and the devices. The second area we focus on is Azure and infrastructure. So traditionally helping customers with their on-premises servers, Active Directory, SQL environments, things like that. And certainly over the past 10 years, we've been transitioning, helping customers move that infrastructure into the Microsoft Cloud, the Azure Cloud, um, where it makes sense to do so. The third business area is the Power Platform. So we design, we build, and we maintain apps, dashboards, and automation processes for our enterprise clients. These improve business efficiency and help eradicate those dreaded manual processes or paper-based processes that we all hate. And finally, we provide a mixture of support services from break fix support um, through to proactive support, where we keep you ahead of the curve with 365, all the way through to managed services, where our service desk effectively becomes your service desk. Across each of those technology areas that you see on the screen, um, the ways in which we actually engage around uh, with businesses, again, there's four key areas. So the first one is technical readiness. Uh, this is looking at where you are today, where you want to get to. And with a file migration, um, for example, it could be help, helping bridge the gap. We do this through workshops, strategy sessions, and design activities. The second area is, is migration, um, what we're focusing on here today. This could be a file server to 365 migration, a SharePoint to SharePoint online migration, or a tenant to tenant migration. And today we'll be running through some best practice and sharing our experience with you. The third area is governance, security, and compliance. Again, quite a crucial area for a file migration project, protecting and securing your sensitive information in your Microsoft environment. You have lots of sensitive information and keeping you safe and legal online has to be a priority and has to be factored in to these file migrations. And finally, it's user adoption and change management. Again, quite a key component of any file migration as you could be fundamentally changing the way that users interact with files. If you consider the key differences between um, you know, using File Explorer and a file server uh, versus how you interact with files across SharePoint, Teams, and OneDrive, that's a big change in user behavior. So we encourage user adoption change management to be baked in as part of these projects to drive engagement over the long term. Um, and that's Silver Sands in the slide. So thank you very much. I'll now pass over to Rob to kick off the webinar. Rob, over to you, please. Thank you, Mike. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So in today's webinar, I'm going to talk around how in principle to migrate file data to Microsoft 365. And in particular, I'm going to focus on migrating content from on-premises file systems into SharePoint Online. But the same principles will apply to data hosted in other sources and 
when I also talk about migrating data to SharePoint Online, I'm also including in that migrating data into Microsoft Teams and OneDrive for Business. I've decided to split today's webinar into four topics that, from our experience in migrating content, are quite key into driving a successful migration project. So we're going to start with planning for mark files in Microsoft 365. So this looks at what you need to consider when kind of planning a share planning your SharePoint sites to host the migrated content and also how we translate your current on-premises file systems or other files into Microsoft into SharePoint or Microsoft 365 sites. We will then look at migration strategies, so highlighting our tried and tested techniques and other considerations you might need to make in order to have a successful migration. We'll then move on to user adoption and training. Now, this will be quite a high level overview of user adoption, but it's critical to a file migration because one of the key issues you'll find when migrating content into 365 is that we're going to change the way that users will interact with the files. So we're going to share a few key tips for ensuring that your users are equipped to deal with this transition. Finally, and we'll briefly look at security and compliance. So migrating data into Microsoft 365 allows you to take advantage of some of the features of Microsoft Purview to enhance the security and integrity of your data. And in this section, I'll briefly look at some of these and how they can help protect you, your data. So let's start with planning for SharePoint governance. So before we, we, we dive into this, I just want to have a few moments to think about why we might be moving our file data into Microsoft 365. Now, there can be many drivers why you might want to migrate this data. Some common examples include your data is hosted on a legacy Windows file server that is running an unsupported version of Windows or is on old or unsupported hardware. You might have some subscriptions to cloud file systems which are you know, costly or come into the end of a contract and you want to kind of move on from there. Or is it that you want to take advantage of some of the increased collaboration and document management capabilities of Microsoft 365 to increase productivity in your organization? So we we'll just say before we you know, say embark on a project to migrate content to SharePoint, we just need to reflect as to you know consider the benefits of doing so, you know if they exceed the you know, effort and cost of you know the actual migration process. So as I mentioned earlier, um, a key thing to think about when you migrate any content into Microsoft 365 is going to be how it impacts your users, the ones that interact with the data on a day-to-day -day basis. Depending on their experience of Microsoft 365, this could be a big change for them. You know, tasks that they regularly do every day in a particular way will have to change. Users will have to find and navigate the data, and, you know, and even how their Office programs, the Word Excel, interact with that data will be different. So user adoption is a key challenge in the migration, and it's a theme I will keep repeating throughout this presentation. But from a planning perspective, one of the most important tasks that need to be done is determining how the structure of your data will look in Microsoft 365. Now you can see a brief example on the screen here of a you know a typical file share hosted on the Windows server. You know we've got several root folders, HR accounts, facilities, and each folder has a number of subfolders. And we know on the file server that will go many folders deep. So when we move this content to Microsoft 365, there are several things that we need to think about when planning the target site or team. Okay, so the first thing is changes are needed for a modern experience. We ideally want to make changes to how the data is presented when we move it to 365. How it is laid out on the file server may not be the best design for laying it out on Microsoft 365. A new security model may be needed. We need to look at how the content will be structured so that appropriate access permissions can be applied to it. While it is possible to migrate content retaining its current permissions, this is not always the most appropriate way of migrating content, as there are some limitations which will affect it. There are limitations around the maximum number of unique permissions around the document library, which, you know, if you've got a legacy file server, it's likely there's going to be a significant number of permissions down there. So it therefore may be more effective to reorganize this data <coughs> into one or more document libraries, excuse me, <coughs> or sites so they can be copied across without retaining permissions and a new permission model applied directly in 365. 
If we do decide to retain permissions, we may find that the copy process becomes much slower, and this will in turn reduce the amount we can copy in the migration window, leading to a longer project or increased disruption to end users. We will need to review the file content. And this will highlight that not all content from the file servers will necessarily be migrated to 365. There may be some older legacy content that you may not require, or there may be issues with the content itself, meaning it must remain on the file server. Data will need to be reorganized. Depending on the use case for the data, it may need to be moved into multiple sites or, or, or some into SharePoint, some into Teams, depending on how it's going to be used in the future and who's using it. We need to review things about automated processes that interact with that data on premises. And, I, um, and they may need to be amended or they may be compatible when we move to data 365. And so this will affect if we can migrate the data or not. And finally, we need to consider sharing. So migrating content into Microsoft 365 provides a great sharing collaboration capabilities. You know, that's one of its key benefits. But there is naturally some data in your environment which you do not want shared with people outside of the organization. So when considering the target environment, it may be necessary to reorganize this data so that the content, which is internal only, is held in you know, different sites so that it cannot be shared externally. So let's continue to look at our file server example over the next couple of slides. So in this image, you can see that the plan is to migrate the three departmental areas directly into three SharePoint sites. However, in doing so, the data has not been arranged to make it suitable for SharePoint. The use case of the folders has not been understood, neither has the complex permission structure. The temptation is to migrate the data as is, retaining all the permissions, but as I mentioned before, there are several limitations. So look at our example. What if the HR department has different requirements for the data they currently host within their area? For example, the people responsible for pay reviews want to make use of Teams features to increase collaboration on their content. They also want to have a single place for their discussions and meeting around their work. The HR policy team want a separate site where they can control who has access to create, revise and read HR policy documents that are in progress. Well, access to the remainder of the HR departments you know, could need to be managed centrally. HR also may want to decide that it's, they will have a, you know, have a need to be able to easily navigate between the different sites they have. So if we take this and move it to a different approach, how could it look? So in this example, you can see that the HR site has been migrated into one of three new sites. A central HR hub containing recruitment and staffing information that's managed centrally by the IT team. The HR policies have been migrated into their own site under HR hub, with the policy team leader being an owner of the site, allowing them to manage access. And finally, the pay review data has been placed into a team, allowing the pay review team to collaborate using Teams channel. We've also amended the security on the site so that it prevents external sharing for the pay review data. Beyond the HR team, you can see that there's an account site which contains the invoicing data. However, during the migration planning process, which we'll talk about later, it was found that some of the data in the purchase orders folder was used in such a way as to make it unsuitable for migration to SharePoint. So we've decided to keep it on premises for now. And I, I mentioned earlier, but when we plan our file migration to SharePoint, we must understand that there is some data which you cannot migrate to SharePoint online easily or at all. And you may have to leave some of it on premises, either permanently or temporarily. You will need to look, then look at mitigating this as you need to replace your file servers. Either by changing the process or migrating the data to an alternative solution, perhaps as your files might meet your needs. You know, solutions which can provide familiar file server-like experiences which will work with the processes you have that interact with that data. Finally, we can see that facilities team have decided that their data access requirements are better met with a single Microsoft team. So what I hope you're seeing for this simple example is that file migration to SharePoint Online is not as straightforward as it, as it might first be thought. To help us with deciding where and how to migrate our data, we should look to develop a series of governance standards for the content that is in scope of the migration. Now, these governance standards will provide a framework for our migrated data and the sites that contain those data and will simplify the migration planning process. Now, as an organization, you may already have a well-defined governance structure for your SharePoint sites, in which case you need to determine how your migrated content will fit within that structure. 
alternatively, you may not have a governance structure in place at all, and you, you could use this as an opportunity to start some basic governance decisions. So when defining the target site governance, there are a few things that we need to consider. Firstly, if we're migrating data, is there an existing SharePoint site or a team that is suitable to host that data? You know, do, in our previous example, do the facilities team already have a team that they're currently using? Can the data be accommodated in that team? Do we need to provision a new site? If we had to provision a new site, we need to think about what type of site we need to provision. So again, the type of site will be heavily influenced by how the users will access the site and how they'll use the site, what permissions model will need to be applied to the site. You know, for example, if, if it's a, a site that can take content that's being migrated to a site that just needs to be accessed by people, you know, it contains policies, then maybe a communication site is appropriate for your needs. But it's more likely migrating from file servers into SharePoint that it's going to be a site that's used for collaboration, in which case we need a team site. Now we can choose either group enabled or non group enabled team sites and the choice we make will depend whether the site is going to be managed by essentially by IT if the site has complicated permissions or if you want a more simpler site that can be managed by members of the department themselves. And finally, we might decide that we want to migrate our content into a Microsoft team. So again, these are suitable for areas that may want a more simpler interface to access and collaborate on their data want to be able to grant permissions to the data themselves. Um, want to be able to you know, have conversations around that data. It makes advantages of a channel message and channel posts. Again, they also might mean the advantage of Teams private and shared channels. So if they're having quite a simple permissions model, using private and shared channels allow for different access rights to be applied to different people or different channels. Site governance should also consider the end user's experience, how users will navigate to the sites, consider if there'll be any benefit to grouping similar sites. You know, I, you know, previously we talked about the HR hub in our example, you know, so we could maybe, maybe, maybe beneficial to group sites under a single hub to provide a common navigation menu and branding and search capability. Now, the long term state of the site also needs to be considered. Okay, so in the future, we may want to delete the, delete the site. What's the process that needs to be followed for deleting that site? Is there maybe a need to back up this site using you know, the new Microsoft 365 backup capability or a third party product? At some point, will there be a, a requirement to archive some or whole of the you know, some data on the site or the whole site? So you just need to think about decisions now. It's good to think about them nice and early as opposed to when it comes to, to needing to do so. Finally, the impact of a policy should be considered. Brief example, if you have retention policies applied to a SharePoint site, any new sites you could you create or existing sites would automatically be in scope of that retention policy. So if this is the case and the retention policies are configured to delete content after you know, X number of days, months, years, etc., then the migrated content could be subject to those would be subject to those periods. And if the original when created or when modified metadata is preserved when the files are migrated, that might have a, a, an impact on it sooner than you think. So next in our governance decisions, we look towards the security and ownership of the data in your site. So I just want to spend a couple of seconds talking about data ownership in Microsoft 365. So when we migrate content to 365, and we talked about it a minute ago about the who controls permissions to sites, you know, so there's naturally going to be a shift in who is responsible for the security and integrity of that data. If the ability to control access to that site is delegated to people within the business, then consideration needs to be made to their responsibilities around the ownership of that data. Additionally, obviously, in free survivors, it's easier to share content with people outside of those who would normally have access to the site, much easier than it is on the file server. So when we design our user adoption, we need to make sure that people are aware of their responsibilities around data ownership. We also need to think about the site permission model. So we did talk previously about why we need to use different types of SharePoint sites for the data, for different permission structures. Here we're going to look at who's responsible for site access. As I said, it's common now to delegate access to control access to sites to people who manage teams in the business. You know, this allows them to add and remove users from the site without having to raise a call with the service desk or follow IT procedures. Now we call these people owners, and ideally there'll be at least two for each site. Alternatively, we can keep with the, the current model. Centrally controlled sites are managed by IT, who will need to add or remove people to sites similar as they do now to on-premises file servers. 
Again, it's, and it's likely that you know, the actual answer is going to be a combination of the two. We'll also need to consider the impact of joiners, movers and leavers on site permissions, particularly where you've delegated site access control to people in the, in the department. Whilst you know, for new starters, it's easy because they don't have access to the site and they, they can be given access and leavers, you know, their account should be disabled by IT as a lead organisation. We need to think about movers. You know, we need to take care to ensure that when people move department, the site owners who have delegated responsibility for managing access to that site remove people who move organisation. Because as they move into their new role, continued access to that data may not be, in, may not be appropriate. And then lastly, we'll look at the governance around sharing. Content in Microsoft 365 can you know, be shared easily internally and externally. I need to understand the impact of the sharing. How does your global sharing policy affect the sharing of sites created for the migrated data? Who should be able to share content in the sites? You know, by default, all owners and members of a site can share the content in the site. Should that be restricted to owners only? Do you need to think about which sites will, will allow and which sites will not allow external sharing and make provision for disabling sharing on some of these sites? Typically, that would be sites that contain sensitive information. If we do allow external sharing, what security control should we enforce on the site? Should the external recipient be required to you know, complete multi-factor authentication or should there be a terms of use document they need to read and agree to for that allow access? If we migrate data into Microsoft Teams, we need to consider should that team allow guests or not? And if we do allow guests, what's the procedure for managing that guest access in the team? Because obviously once a guest is added to the team, they're in that team until somebody removes them, which may not always be appropriate. So we just need to think about the kind of a life cycle of the sharing and governance around teams and as well. Okay. So finally, to kind of finish the the governance session, I want to again walk through another small demonstration and take us through how a department might structure its data for immigration. So it's, it's quite similar to four, but I just want to show you the experience on the end users. So let's consider this as an example. We have a company, um, Contoso, and in that company is a sales department. And that sales department has a legacy folder structure in one of their organization's file shares. Now, due to reliability issues, we've decided that you know, aging set file server hardware, out of date windows, we need to we need to do something with their data. And we've decided to migrate it to Microsoft 365. So there's been some engagement with the, the people in Contoso Sales and the Contoso IT, IT team. And you know, we found out that the IT department is consists of a number of different teams. Who, so that the, the sales department consists of a number of different teams who all have different use cases for their file data. So we've got sales and marketing. They need to collaborate with their external marketing partners. Whereas monthly reports team work on secure data which, not be, which must not be shareable to persons outside of the business. Additionally, we know that the file server has been in place for many years and there are significant amounts of data which is historical and no longer required. So on the screen now, I put a visualization of their current file server structure. So we've got four top level directories, campaigns, marketing materials, monthly reports, prospects, so, considering the requirements I've outlined and those on the screen, how can that data look in Microsoft 365? So similar to our earlier example, but we can see that we've gone for three sites for their data. We've got a central Contoso sales hub, which contains general sales data. The site is available to all persons within Contoso sales, and, it, and its access is controlled essentially by the IT team as part of the joiners, movers, and leavers process. Sales marketing material has been migrated into its own team, which is controlled and managed by nominated people in that team. And the sales monthly report similarly has been placed into its own, own team. So let's look at this in practice and see how the user's experience has changed. So if I just go over here. Okay, we have a, a typical workstation for a Contoso employee here. Okay, and currently they access their files using Two seconds like using Windows Explorer. And here we see we've got a typical shared drive. In there, we've got some departments and we go to sales and we can see here's the sales areas. OK, and we all know, you know in the monthly reports, we can go in there. We can see our monthly reports going back 10 years and, and people can 
interact with these reports quite easily and they can oops I'll choose one with some data in they can interact with interact with these reports and they can you know manipulate them as quite quite easily to do so as part of this for the sales monthly reports team we've decided to migrate their data into a Microsoft team and that's over here so if we look over here we've got a Microsoft team for sales monthly reports and in there we can see channels relating to the various years of the report and then we decided because the data there's quite a lot of historic data on there that we'll leave any reports older than three years in situ and they can then be archived later to a different solution so now when users want to go and view the monthly reports they use the team's interface to do so and they can still quite easily go to the channels um, we can see here there's a conversation around a the germany june report so building that collaboration already and we go into the files tab we can see quite easily that here's a here's the reports and then people can work and collaborate on them and they can access them as normal or the also around the monthly reports again team we did talk about the requirements for them to self-manage their environment so again if we look at this here we can see that there are two nominated people here who can manage from access to this. so Adele and Megan will control who can access the report the reports area is secure so if I try and share a file with somebody outside of the organization so here we go so I'll try and share this with myself we can see we get a message saying I can only share it within my organization similarly if I try and add a guest to this team we can see that it's not permitted we can't couldn't find any matches so we've built a secure area for the people within um, monthly reports. Again, it's quite a change to the way that they work. Now let's look at the people who work for the um, sales marketing material. Again, they have a, an area of the home of the shared drive here, and there's their data in here. And similarly, and they, their data is going into, as we can see here, a, a team. So similarly to as before, we've got our sales marketing team here and here's their data in the team. We get channel posts and here's the data. But the difference with this team and why I kind of want to share it to you is in this team, we have a different security model applied and that's why they were chosen to go into their own team. We can go in here and we can share that content with people outside the organization without issue. We can also add external persons to the team because we've allowed guest access. So again, it's a similar interface to the user, but the experience is slightly different. What we can do with the team is a bit more open. And then finally, I'll just show you, because with the last part of the organization, the campaigns and prospects area have been migrated into a generic Contoso sales SharePoint site. So if we go over here, we can see that I've provisioned a Contoso sales SharePoint site, and then we have the areas here. So again, we've got the campaigns element here. All the data has been migrated across. People, when they want to work on it, now they can open files, and it's a you're loading the Office applications. And here we go. Now, can they continue to work on this now? And then they, they start to benefit immediately from having the data in SharePoint, because obviously we now have auto save. So there's no need for users to start saving data. It's automatically saved when changes are made into the environment. If they want to, if they want to create new documents, again, they get wherever, they, wherever they're going in their team, they can go, you know, they can create new documents from here. And the documents created. But what I'm just trying to get across, because we all know how to create documents and work with teams, is it's a different way of working for the users. And if users are doing repeatable tasks, such as completing in forms and spreadsheets, um, uploading you know, invoices, or whatever they're doing in their environment on a daily basis, to, and they're used to doing it to file servers quickly, it's going to be a bit of a change doing it in, in SharePoint and Teams. OK. So I think once we've dis determined our rough governance structure, it's time now to move on to thinking about how we plan a migration. So the first thing I want to say, and it's very important that I say this, is that you should not underestimate the amount of effort and the elapsed time that is needed to migrate data to SharePoint Online. One of the critical tasks when planning this migration is going to be engagement with the business. These are the people who touch the data on a daily basis and therefore are successful to migration because they can help us to understand that data. But it can be difficult 
and time consuming to get the business to engage. Especially when in their eyes, they're working fine at the moment on their current file server. Okay, they may not see a need to migrate to 365, they might see it as a bit of a hindrance to their day-to-day -day activities. Secondly, the physical act of migrating data in Microsoft 365 can be much slower than you might expect. There is only so much data we can migrate in a defined down window. And if you're used to doing on-premises file migrations, the, the, the rate is significantly slower. Okay. So when we plan our migration, we need to think about an end-to-end -end strategy for the whole migration project. So we'll just break it down to phases. The first, let's think about planning. In the planning phase, we define the project. What are we migrating? What, are, what the priorities are. We need to review the source data and start to identify project stakeholders, i.e. the people in the business who own that data. We also start to make high level decisions on the governance strategy for the target sites. Once we've done that, we need to start thinking about our user adoption preparation. And this is where we design and create the communications and training material, <clears throat> which we'll cover in more detail later. Then there's a phase of technical readiness. In this technical readiness phase, we prepare, test and validate the migration tooling. Now, there are several different ways to migrate data into SharePoint. There's manually uploading data. You can use scripts or migration tools. And whichever method you use depends on the number of factors. However, it must be noted that in order to maintain some key pieces of the metadata, created date, modified date, created by, modified by, etc., a migration tool must generally be used. Now, common migration tools include those provided by Microsoft free of charge, such as a SharePoint migration tool or migration manager, through to third party tools, for example, ShareGate or other ones out there. Now, I'm not going to go into the pluses and minuses of these tools or, or compare them against each other, but I will say that you should test and evaluate the tools in your environment. Different migration speeds have been observed in different organizations' environments as the migration tools are affected by a number of outside factors, such as the performance of the migration server, the locality of the source data to the migration server, network connectivity, and then when we migrate data, they can be affected by throttling by Microsoft. It should also be noted that it may be desirable to use different tools within the same project, because some tools are more better suited the complex permissions and metadata mapping, whereas others are faster just migrating data without permissions. So typically you might find a combination of tools being used for, for a single migration project. As part of this migration tool and testing, it is important that we benchmark the migration performance of your chosen tools using large amounts of sample data. This will help us determine how much data we can migrate in a given window and help us when planning our migration batches. Hi there. It's critical that the whole end-to-end -end migration sprint process should be tested using a pilot. This tests all activities in the migration from end-to-end -end user engagement, testing communications to users, testing training, and testing the post-migration support process to help identify common issues and resolve them before we go into production migrations. Following the pilot, we use migration sprints, which are a repeatable process to migrate the data. Now we'll cover the migration sprint in a couple of slides time. Okay. So, I now just want to focus on some more of the activities that you need to consider when scoping and planning both the project and the migration sprint. Okay, so I've got identify source locations. And this is more than what than saying what file servers need to be migrated. This is looking at the data on that file server at the share level or even at levels, you know, department level, or even levels below that, depending on how you structure your data. Its aim is to group the source areas into chunks that can be used, that together can be used to create migration batches based upon what is achievable in the migration window. The migration batches will take account of the size of the data, but also who touches the data. It's generally desirable to migrate 
the same area in, in, in similar batches or batches that are close to each other. At the same time, we as I said before, we identify who owns interacts with the data. We then need to engage those data owners to agree what content they want to bring across. Now, as I said, not all content in an area is typically needed. Some of the content we legacy are not required. Now, these conversations you have with the business owners can be helped with some additional analysis of the source data. So if you're, for example, to anal analyze the age of files on a typical file server, it would not be surprising to discover that the majority of those files will be more than five years old, with a significant number, maybe even older, say 10 years old. So on, if you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, there's an orange bar graph. Now, that is a typical result we, we would see after analyzing a folder on a file server. Okay, and we do seem to see a, a way to a lot towards the older data and the reason, very old data. And the reason for that is previously when your file servers became end of life and the support, disks were cheaper. Every time you, every time files were replacing, the disks were bigger, disks were cheaper. And typically what happened, people just used to copy the whole file server across to a new server. There was no data cleansing carried out. So over time, the amount of historical data on the file server just grows. Now, moving that data to the SharePoint is not good now an ideal time to think about what data we actually need. Should we be considering just take, bringing across data which users require in SharePoint and not bring a load of, of legacy data that's very, very rarely or if, it, if at all accessed? When we do initial additional analysis on data for migration, we should really expand it to check for any issues with the source data that might prevent it from being migrated. Now, there are some on the screen here, and I'm not going to go through them all, but some key ones that we need to address are things like invalid file names. You know, SharePoint does not allow certain characters in file names, examples being you know, asterisk or question mark. Um, there are also some other issues that, that invalid cause invalid folder names in SharePoint. For example, you can't have a folder called Forms at the root of a document library. We need to think about file path limits. Again, if you look at your on-premises file servers, you'll find that some of the data does go pretty deep and has very, very long file paths. Now, when we migrate content into, into SharePoint, the maximum path length for a file can't exceed 400 characters. So we need to find content as close to this path length and to determine what's going to need to happen to that. We need to shorten the path length or move it to a different location. Other key issues are high volumes of documents and folders. Um, so any folders that contain more than 5,000 items cannot be migrated without issue. And we should amend that source location just to remove the problem to make the migration smoother. A key problem we'll find are files which contain embedded links into other areas, other files. Obviously, when we move the content into SharePoint, the embedded links become invalid. So we need to engage with end users to understand what files would have embedded links in and develop a, a plan to deal with those post migration. Typically, you would find that in areas where people working with um, finance or accounting spreadsheets, very common users of, of linking to other documents. And I think finally, I want to pick up on automated processes. This is where you have folders on your on-premises file server where content is placed, extracted, moved, modified using some form of automated process. We need to adapt this process to work with in SharePoint, move it to Power Automate, um, or maybe that's not possible. Maybe in the short term, we need to keep that on the file server, or as I mentioned before, find an alternative solution to host that piece of data. And finally, returning to the planning aspects of it, think about scheduling. When we engage with data owners, they are able to revise the key availability constraints of their data. Now, is access to their data only needed Monday to Friday, nine to five, or do they need extended access out of hours? You know, once we understand what, how they, how, when they need to access the data, we can start to plan when it can be migrated. We know how long it's going to take to migrate the data. We know how much, how much data is being migrated, and we know our migration window. So we can decide whether it needs to be migrated in the evening or at the weekend, and how it may be fit together with other areas to batch together into one migration sprint. We also need to think about there may be some areas which are higher priorities than others. 
So, for example, this could be to do with I don't know, a legacy file server um, having issues that might cause it to fail in the short term versus other ones which are pretty stable. Uh, there may be a requirement to move some of the content to SharePoint quickly to meet a particular business need. Some departments may already use SharePoint and have kind of a mixed SharePoint file server kind of experience and want to move all of their data into one location. So they can be prioritized first. So once we've scoped the migration, migration process is agreed, we've kind of agreed our, our rough migration batches, we need to use what's called a migration sprint to actually migrate the data into SharePoint. So, you know, there's a few steps in the sprint and we start with planning the sprint. You know, we review the source data, um, we sign off the um, mapping and the final migration approach and sign it off ready for migration. Preparation. This is where we do any preparation to both the source and the target environment. So in the source we're talking about, you know, long file paths, maybe rearranging the data, dealing with folders with, with more than 5,000 items in them. Um, we talk about creating the target sites, creating any permissions on the target sites, and preparing the migration jobs in the tool we've chosen to migrate the data. Train. Here end user communication is delivered to their aware of the migration, what steps they must take and when. Um, we also delivered user adoption training at this point. And what we want to do is we want to deliver that training as close to the migration sprint as possible. So it's still fresh in their minds for the migration. Migrate. In this step, we migrate the content using one or more passes of the migration tool, followed by validation of the data. Once confirmed, access to the legacy file server environment is removed. Support. Following the migration, there's a period of post go live support when users can reach out immediately for assistance in finding their files and resolving issues with working with those in, in SharePoint. Now, there are quite a number of techniques that we can use to do this post go live support. Quite a popular technique we found is to use what we'd call virtual floor walking where we'd have a Teams meeting running for the morning after migration, and we just it's just an open meeting. End users have been migrated, you can just drop into that meeting, ask questions, and receive an immediate response to, to their problem. So they haven't got to wait for support to come them back. It's a very quick resolution to those initial issues when people have difficulty accessing their data following the migration. And then finally in the batch, we transition this migration sprint, so the target SharePoint site, to BAU who then become responsible for management of those sites going forward. We then move on to the next batch and repeat. In our migration batches though, there are several things that we do to minimize the risk in the migration. So it's important we do this to ensure the integrity, security, integrity and availability of the data. So think about security. So the first thing that we need to do is ensure that the data is security is maintained E.D. the correct permissions are in place in the target environment to restrict access to that data. Data integrity and availability. As I said, in the migration process, we must validate the data to ensure that all content is copied across successfully. We also need to think about the availability of that data. So in planning the migration and communicating with those end users, we need to be aware of, we need to make them aware, and we need to be aware of issues that could occur if multiple passes of the migration tool are run against the data. So if an area has a large amount of data in a very short downtime window, it's quite common to initially see that data in advance of the migration. This allows us to check that to ensure there are no issues with the content as it's copied, and then to reduce the amount of downtime required for migration to whichever. Some tools are, are set, can do a kind of incremental copy at a much higher speed. So therefore, we, you know, we reduce the actual cutover point for the window for the for the for the migration. The risk with doing this though is that migration tools aren't that intelligent. Okay, we're not intended enough to handle files that have been deleted and moved in the source or been deleted in the target. So if users perform those actions against the source after the initial copy, like they delete a few files, they could find those files reappearing in the targets after the migration. So we advise them of that in the end user communication and in the training material. We ask them not to do this for the for the migration window between the initial copy and the final copy. However, if that window is quite long, it's more likely to occur. So we just need to be mindful of that happening. And then, again, to protect the integrity of the data, we need to ensure that users are no longer able to access the source environment, or maybe they have read-only access to the data for a short period of time, following that migration, to ensure there's only a single active version of a document. 
And then finally, in the migration planning, I just want to say to speed up the migration process, it's in, we can, we, you can investigate running multiple migration sprints or batches at the same time and laying them up at different stages of the sprint at the same time so that you're kind of continually migrating data as opposed to doing one sprint end to end and then starting the next one. It's kind of more efficient to kind of layer them together. So this kind of concludes what I want to talk about in migration strategies. Let's switch our focus now to user adoption and training. As I repeatedly said throughout this, this, this session today, moving content from the on-premises file server to SharePoint, OneDrive teams, it can be quite a change in the experience for the end user, especially if there's no ex prior experience in it. And we showed that during our demonstration earlier, you know, how they're going to work with files differently. So what we need to try and do is provide the end user with guidance and training so they can effectively interact with their data in Microsoft 365 without having to resort to legacy ways of working in a new environment. Now, what I mean by that is there's a tendency sometimes for people to fall back to using the OneDrive Sync client to kind of replicate the, the Windows Explorer experience they're familiar with. Now, while there are some limited use cases of using Sync client with SharePoint, it needs to be used with caution and should not be seen as a de facto way to access SharePoint content. As yet, there are limitations and there are issues when using it. So what we need to do is impart to the user the benefits of using Microsoft 365 effectively by selling it to them, why it makes their experience better. So typical examples you would use would be around the increased collaboration, the ability to share links with colleagues, so we'd have to email attachments, you know, thereby reducing document duplication and creating a single version of a truthful document. You know, there's things like the ability to have version history of a document so users can step back in time, see what changes have been made. They can recover files from a cycle bin more easily than, you know, than that. So if they delete a file and that on the file set, they have to go to IT to get it back or use shadow copies. Here, they just go to a cycle bin, the files then, they can restore it in a few seconds. So, so when we design our training material, we must not assume that everybody has the same level of knowledge in SharePoint, OneDrive and Teams. Some people will already be using SharePoint, whereas others do not and will be complete beginners. So some people may be quite happily using Teams chat, Teams with chat and meetings features, but have no experience in using it for file collaboration. Therefore, it's important the training adoption material start from a common base. And then finally, we must communicate to users their increased responsibilities of ownership and access to data. With good training adoption, users will take advantage of the additional capabilities to increase productivity in a secure manner. So how do we help our users? So, firstly, we need to form some idea of the user's current skill set. This can easily be obtained by deploying a very short survey to the organization which will aim to find out how familiar and comfortable users are with working with files in Microsoft 365. The survey will be very, very simple and include questions around how users interact with data. For example, I know how to find and open files in SharePoint. I know how to save a file into a SharePoint site. I know how to copy a file between two channels in a team, etc. So once the survey is ended and we start to plan the training, we must develop different versions of training material for different responsibilities in the SharePoint site or team. So there's four roles on the screen on the screen here. So firstly, we're going to look at the end user. So their training needs to be focused around finding and working with files in SharePoint and Teams. The aim of this, this is to minimize disruption. Owner training, this needs to incorporate the owner's responsibilities around managing access to the site, how they add and remove users and guests how to review sharing on the site. Admin training provides the SharePoint admin with information on configuration and governance policies which apply to sites created as part of the migration project. Support team training should focus on providing the support team with information on the project as a whole, including details of sites currently being migrated, lists of common support issues, and the resolution and escalation path through the project for complex issues. So we have several methods to deliver the training to users. Whatever method we use must demonstrate both the change that has occurred to the experience and the benefits of doing so. Um, by clearly demonstrating the benefits, end users can start to see the advantage of hosting their data in SharePoint or Teams. As outlined in the previous section around migration strategy as a whole, it's important we run a pilot activity for the migration, which includes user adoption material. Once developed, we test it, and then the post-pilot review we obtain feedback from the pilot users on the effectiveness of the training and revise it accordingly. 
And if let's say we repeat that after the first few migration sprints, so we continually improve the training to get to, to a good standard that works for the organization. How do we deliver training? Well, there are a couple of ways of delivering training. Um, the method that we find the most success with is running webinars or online classrooms. We feel that we get more engagement from users when they're watching it being demonstrated live and they can ask questions of the person leading the session. Following the webinars, the recordings can be made available online for users to refresh themselves as necessary. We also support the webinars through desk aids. And then finally, it's also important to consider how communication materials delivered to end users. So it's common to use existing organizational practice for communicating change. The last thing I want to mention is that we need to also consider new staff, okay, who are not there for the additional migration training. Okay, so maybe this additional necessary to build additional training into your new start induction packs or simply make the recorded webinars available so that yeah, new starters are brought up to speed on how their data is handled in SharePoint. All right, so I hope you that's given you a very brief overview of how we would how you support a user through the migration process. So the last topic I briefly want to cover today is around security compliance on Microsoft 365 and how you might consider this in respect to your file migration. Now, 365 security compliance is a very, very complicated topic, and we're not going to cover it in any great detail at all today. I'm just going to highlight some key considerations and technologies which you may wish to consider for future deployment following a file migration. Um, we have discussed in SharePoint sharing and highlighting as one of its key features, but incorrect use of sharing can lead to oversharing of data. An example is where content is shared with people in the people in the organization link. If this link is passed to someone else in the organization, that person who may not be the intended recipient can access the data. And that data could be potentially sensitive. So we need to make sure our user training reinforce good sharing practices. We must think about how compliance features could help as well. Other sharing issues can be caused by guest users and teams not being at teams or movers not being actually when they change departments or no longer need access to data. So those people have access to sensitive data and we need to make sure that they only have access to the amount of time they need to have it for. Finally, migrating data into 365 can allow users to find data more easily. What is difficult to find on a file server is easy in 365. If you look at the image to the right of the screen, you can see I've run a very pretty simple search for the words credit card. And we see a number of files are being returned in the search containing credit card details. If users have access to content and they search for a term, it will be returned in that search. So it's important to make sure permissions on the sites we provision for the migration of the data we migrate are such that people do not have access to the content. However, data that exists on the current on-premises file server may not be as understood as it possibly could be, and that there may be sensitive information contained in the file saved in the file share that are many, file, many folders deep, and we don't know that it's there until it's accidentally discovered by somebody doing a search. So what can you do about it? The next two slides are designed to provide you with information, a couple of Microsoft purview features that could help you. So firstly, with purview information protection, we have two features available with sensitivity labels, which can help us control both access to site, team, and the data itself. If you can remember all the way back to the demonstration earlier, we had a team which did not allow external sharing guest access and one which did. I was controlling that, using the, controlling that governance settings on those teams using a sensitivity label I applied to the team. The label enforced the privacy of the site, public or private, whether or not sharing was allowed, whether guest access was allowed, and whether I could access that team which I didn't show you from an unmanaged device. So I can say, actually, I can access that team from an unmanaged device, but I can't download the files. I have to work in the web browser. Now, it's quite a simple way of providing a consistent method of controlling the shareability of data in the site or team. Secondly, if we have data that's more sensitive, we can start to use information protection sensitivity labels to manage access to individual files. Now, unlike previous labels that control sharing, these labels allow you to apply classification security to file by selecting a label in the Office client. Those labels can classify a document, apply marking the document, encrypt the document to limit who can access the document and what their rights are. Now these can enhance security because the labels are applied to the file and will travel with the file once it's been moved out of SharePoint. So if somebody has access to the file, they download it, they will not be able to open it because of the encryption applied to it. And then finally, I just want to draw briefly attention to data loss prevention. Okay. Again, with the credit card document I found you earlier, um, if a user managed to acquire a document that contained credit card numbers, we can use DLP technology to, to form an action to stop them sharing that content via email or SharePoint. 
um, or using a, or using a sharing link. I mean, with DLP, we can detect content. We can stop people attaching it to emails and sending it out. Um, we can provide policy tips to causing users to consider if the information is appropriate, and we can block access to the content, enforce email encryption, and alert and report if people are showing sensitive information. Now, I just want to lastly say implementing sensitive labels in DLP can be a relatively complicated solution to put in place, both technically and because of its ability to impact users' behaviour. We are potentially stopping them from doing something or making them jump through extra hoops to do something they were easily able to achieve before. Previously, the main method for sharing files was on the file server was via email. We have discussed today that there are more options to share files when they are in 365, so it's important to consider if DLP and sensitive labels should feature in your longer term plans for compliance. So that's a very, very brief overview of that. Okay. So that concludes what I want to talk to you about file migration today. I hope it's been useful and give you a high level idea of some of the topics and activities that need to be considered when we migrate data to 365. Now I'm going to hand you back over to Mike. Thanks, Rob. Uh, absolutely brilliant session. Uh, really like that. Lots of useful insights um, and really good engagement. So thank you everyone throughout uh, for your questions posed in the Q&A section. Uh, Rob, I particularly like the, the bit of advice around not just using a single migration tool. I think we've seen a lot of customers that they've gone out and either purchased one or they're using the Microsoft free tool and they just stick with that. And actually different tools have strengths and weaknesses as well. Um, so if you've liked what you've heard um, from today's session, don't forget to book your free one-to-one -one follow up session with Rob. The one-to-one -one sessions are really designed to build on what you've heard today, but tailor it specifically to your requirements and your migration scenarios. Um, so I'll paste that link in the chat box now. It's in the survey. And I guess with four minutes uh, left to go, I appreciate we had questions as we went. Has anyone else got any questions? If you do, um, maybe post those in the Q&A and we can read those out as we go. Just running through, make sure we've got none that are lost. Looks like most of the questions have been answered as, as we've gone, which is great. So um, if there are no questions, that's brilliant. Um, glad we managed to answer those as we as we went. Um, just to say thank you again, Rob. Thank you everyone for attending and we look forward to seeing you at a future event. Rob and I will hold on for the next three minutes just in case that anyone wants to hold, hold fire and ask the questions. Thank you very much.